What's going on guys, Teddy Baldessar here. Now I know how overwhelming watches can be if you're first getting into them. And I've probably put off this video a little bit too long, but I'm excited to finally address the topic today, which is eight topics, eight concepts that I think everybody should know about watches if they have a desire to learn more about them. Now, before we get into this video, head over to teddyballdessert.com, full authorized dealer of 20 brands, also have hundreds of different watch straps available. You can get 5% off your first order. Wait, maybe you don't know what an authorized dealer is. Maybe you don't know how to switch out straps on your watches. You don't know the tools that you need. Well, by the end of this video, you will know exactly how to do that and also know what that means. Now, before we get into this video here, looking at eight topics, one other thing to mention, I have two videos that I think will be good to watch as well in unison with this video. One will be looking at just the terminology around watches. I think it's good to know the different parts of a watch if you want to actually know more about watches. The other one is more about complications. So complications, basically anything outside of just telling the time on a watch. So any other function, for example, on the watch that I'm wearing right now is in 556 has a date complication. So that's a pretty simple one. They get way more complex from there, but I'd also reference that video in addition to this as being a helpful guide. But to begin here, I think the first place to start is looking at the two primary types of watches. And by that, I mean basically the movements inside of them. So you have your mechanical watches and you also have your quartz watches. Now there are two different types of mechanical watches. You have your manual or hand wound watches, which actually require you as a owner of a watch to manually wind the watch using the crown on the side of the case or you also have your automatic watches, which will wind automatically with the help of a winding mass or a rotor on the back of the movement that will wind around or circulate around the movement and help wind the mainspring inside the watch to provide it power. But from here, basically the process for actually telling the time is essentially the same once that watch is wound. Now, all the stored energy in this winding is done by coiling up a mainspring inside a barrel in a watch. Now this is basically the epicenter for where power is stored within a wristwatch. Now what's happening from here is once that mainspring coils up very tightly, it then will gradually start releasing energy through a gear train. And basically we'll go down this gear train to a thing called an escapement and then work in unison with a balance wheel. So what's happening here is that escapement wheel and then a pallet fork is going to lock, unlock, lock, unlock, and then the other end of that pallet fork has a small pin that it's activating on with that balance wheel that's going back and forth, back and forth, basically acting like a pendulum. And that is going to be the basis of being able to tell time. And how this is going to translate on the front end of the watch is you'll find the second hand of a mechanical watch usually ticking as a sweeping second hand. So it's more constant with its flow of movement rather than a tick, tick, tick. It's more tick, 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 tick. So that's what you'll see on that front end. This is not always a foolproof way. Sometimes quartz watches will have kind of more of that sweep being emulated, but that is what's happening. It's using full mechanical energy to power a watch just through gears, springs, and things of that sort. And all these mechanical watches typically will have beat frequencies, three hertz, four hertz, and are not going to last forever. So if you put a mechanical watch down for a period of time, because it's using mechanical power, it needs to be wound, whether through wear or through manual winding, usually we'll have a power reserve, which is basically how long this process of stored energy from that mainspring will happen until it runs out of that stored energy and will gradually just completely uncoil. Now, the other most popular type of watch is a quartz watch. So a quartz watch is going to be a watch instead of mechanical power to actually power the watch, is powered through an actual electrical charge, so using a battery. And quartz movements, unlike mechanical watches, are much more accurate and are much easier to produce once they were developed. And just to give some concept here on accuracy of a quartz, typical cheap quartz watches that are out there are actually more accurate over a month than many mechanical watches are over a day. So how a quartz movement works is through taking power from that battery and then through a small electrical charge that is created by that battery, it is then passed to an integrated circuit and then is gonna be delivered to a quartz crystal. It's cut like a small, small tuning fork inside. It's nearly microscopic here. So not to get too technical here, but when that quartz crystal is sent that specific electrical charge, it is then going to vibrate incredibly quick. So we're talking 32,768 times per second as a result of an idea called the piezoelectric effect, which is basically an idea when electrical impulse is sent to a quartz, it is then going to vibrate at a specific frequency. This was calibrated in a way where it's going to vibrate at that specific frequency here to allow it to tell time. But following that vibration, it's gonna then send a frequency back to the integrated circuit 
that will then send an electromagnetic impulse through coils in a coil block that are in close proximity in order for the hands to move. Now, given the difference in the amount of oscillations taking place between, say, that balance wheel versus this quartz crystal that's vibrating 32,000 times per second, you can imagine that this is going to be more of an accurate movement, which it certainly is. In addition, instead of using mechanical power, it does require a actual third-party stored energy source, which is that battery. So you probably will hear very often you know, a battery having to be replaced on a watch. This is typically for a quartz watch. The other thing to consider here on the front of the watch, and a very easy way to tell in most cases, not always true, but in pretty much 99.9% .9 of cases, on the front of the watch, there'll be a ticking second hand that'll be once per second. That is usually a dead giveaway that it's going to be a quartz watch. So if you're playing along at home, you probably can see that there's a lot of upsides with going with the quartz. When this thing was released, it really did shake the whole industry up. It's easier to produce, it's more accurate, because it uses a battery, you don't have to worry about a power reserve. It's every few years, you're just gonna have to change that battery. And then usually they're more affordable batteries. But why are mechanical watches usually more sought after from collectors? I think it really comes down to the romantic idea. Because they're usually handcrafted, there's more moving parts. The fact that it doesn't use an external power supply and it's all using just gears and components of that nature, I think there's a lot of just endearing attributes about it, and it really goes into more of the romantic idea rather than it is more of the technological feat that it's able to accomplish. So now for number two on our list for this video today, we have just understanding the industry, the different brands that make up the industry. I've done a video on this subject where I really do a deep dive into the different brands of the industry and how it's all structured, but really how it's structured is very similar to the automotive industry. There's large conglomerates that own many of the brands that make up it. So just to go through a few of these, we first have the Swatch Group. So this is a Swiss group. It was formed out of the ashes of the struggles facing the industry during the 20th century. So this includes brands from a, really just a wide variety of different price categories. So you have Swatch on the entry level side. You also have Tissot, Hamilton, Longines. You have Omega, which is really their mainstream luxury product. And you also have higher end brands like a Breguet, for example. And then in addition, they also own movement manufacturer Etta, which we can discuss a little bit more in a bit. Then from a luxury end of the watch category, you also have Richemont. So Richemont, very similar in terms of diversification like Swatch, but also has different luxury brands. So you have Cartier, Vacheron Constantin, JLC, IWC, Mont Blanc, Langa, Panerai, and many others. Then you also have the Seiko Group. So this is the Japanese powerhouse group that owns brands like Seiko, Orient, Grand Seiko, Credor, and other brands as well, as well as offering up their own movements to be used by third parties. Then you also have the other Japanese group, the Citizen Group with, of course, Citizen watches. And then you also have Bulova, uh, other Swiss manufacturing brands like Alpina and Frederic Constant. And then also they own the movement manufacturer, Miyota. Then you have a brand that you're probably familiar with, Rolex, and then also Tudor. Both of those brands are privately owned and operated and are huge powerhouses in the industry, of course. Then you have LVMH, which is essentially the largest luxury conglomerate in the world, and they've gradually started to grow their offering in terms of watches. So they own brands like Tag Heuer, Zenith, Hublot, and others. Then you have the Caring Group, which has also started to get into watches, large luxury group, Elise Nardin, Gerard Perigo. And then you have more independent brands. So you have Patek Philippe, which is independently operated. You have Audemars Piguet as well. You have Breitling, but now has just been owned by a private equity firm, but is again, kind of independently owned for the most part. And you also have smaller brands like a Nomos, which is a very nicely operated independent brand with great output. You have Zinn, Oris, and this is just scratching the surface. There are so many smaller brands out there but from a macro point of view, these are just some of the bigger brands that you'll commonly see. And chances are a lot of the brands that you'll probably see from the mainstream point of view will typically be under one of these brand structures. Now, number three is how your watch should fit and how to think about this when making a purchase. With more people buying watches online, I think it's very important to understand how a watch should fit you. Now, when looking at how a watch should fit, there's a few things to understand. First is you should know the circumference of your actual wrist, try on different watches and understand what makes the most sense to you. But what I would recommend from a dimension point of view, the three things that are gonna be uh, probably the most important, one is going to be the case diameter, one is going to be the thickness and the other is going to be lug to lug. So case diameter, pretty self-explanatory, basically is the first thing mentioned with a manufacturer when selling online, they're gonna mention the case diameter. And that's certainly gonna be an important factor. Then you have your case thickness, which 
is also very important. If you don't want something that's huge, big and bulky, it will, I think, depend depending on the type of complication, the type of watch, whether it's gonna be make or break for you. And then you also have lug to lug. This is a dimension that's typically not provided by manufacturers, but if I had to say of the three, that's probably the most important in being able to determine if a watch is going to fit you, this would probably be the one. And this is measuring from the top of a watch up here from the bottom of a lug to the top position at the top of the lug. So we're kind of more measuring it from top to bottom here. So for me, I have a six and a quarter inch wrist. And typically for me on the lower end of watches, I like 34 to 36 millimeters when it comes to case uh, sizes and typically getting around like 40 millimeters lug to lug and up. And then going on the higher end, usually 39 to 42 millimeters for sports watches is kind of where I make that cutoff and 50 millimeters is that lug to lug distance. When it comes to thickness, I think anything under 12 millimeters for more of a dress or casual watch is a great choice. And then anything under 14 millimeters or around there for divers and chronographs. But I think 14.5 is usually my cutoff there. These type of just uh, basis points I think are very subjective, but you just have to try on different watches and really understand kind of what's best for you. So lug to lug and why I think this is so important is the watch that I'm wearing right now has around a 45 millimeter lug to lug distance, but its case diameter is 38.5 millimeters. But when you put it next to say this Nomos Orion, which has a 35 millimeter case and around a 44.8 millimeter lug to lug distance, it actually goes to show how two watches that have 3.5 just difference in case diameter often will wear on the wrist kind of in terms of lug to lug very similar just because of the longer lugs on that Nomo. So this is why I think lug to lug is just very important. It's usually something that's not factor in and I think is something you probably wanna consider when looking at a watch. But again, often you're gonna to have to try to find it from a third party because manufacturers don't provide this. Another thing to consider in from the case diameter standpoint, but also from the thickness standpoint, when looking at a case diameter, if a case diameter is 40 millimeters, but say it has a bezel, for example, on the watch, what that is going to do from a perception standpoint is make that dial appear smaller. Uh, for example, this Young Hans Maxwell chronoscope has a 40 millimeter uh, actual case diameter. It's lug to lug is very compact in comparison to this Rolex Explorer 2, which has a 40 millimeter case diameter as well and a much larger lug to lug distance. But when you put them next to each other or stra strap them on the wrist, for example, uh, they have very different types of wearing experience because one is all dial and one has that outer bezel. So that's something to consider. And then another thing to consider is thickness. If thickness is, where is it residing? If it's residing mostly in the case, then that is gonna wear much different than if it was residing in the crystal. So this Maxpo Chronoscope has a thickness of 14.5 millimeters, but majority of that is gonna happen from the dome crystal. That wear is a lot different because of that. You don't really feel that when you have it on the wrist in comparison to the actual case, say with a Tudor Black Bay, which is kind of have like a slabbed off side of the case, which is just gonna wear a little bit thicker on the wrist. But again, this is very subjective. You just kind of have to try things on, figure out what's best for you, get your wrist size, try on different watches, even if it's not the watch you're gonna buy, and that'll be a good way of figuring out what the best watch is for you. So next up, we have straps and tools to really help take your watch to the next level. Now, I always heard, I heard this conversation one time, it was, it was with an old friend of mine who said, I like the Apple Watch because I can swap out the straps on the Apple Watch. Well, I think that's a really good point in showing that I think a lot of people do not consider that for a watch that you're looking at, in most cases, you can just switch out the strap with a lot of third party options. So I have hundreds of different straps on my site. I think it's a great way to just get the most out of your watch. Now really all you really need to understand to be able to switch out a strap on your watch is to understand the lug width or the distance between the two lugs on the watch. You'll just wanna get something that's going to fit that. So for example, the watch I have on right now, 20 millimeter lug width. And by switching out the straps on it, you can see how it just has totally different looks. You can put a NATO strap on it where it just will really look more casual then you also have the metal bracelet that it actually comes on. So that's gonna have a more sporty look. Then you also have leather straps, which is gonna kind of give it more of a field watch or maybe even a more dressy appearance. And there's different leathers that you could choose from. Once you figure out that lug width, you can have a ton of fun with this and be able to swap these out. The only thing you have to consider is some watches have integrated bracelets. So for example, this Maurice Lacroix Icon, how that bracelet is meeting the case is very unique and it's pretty custom. So in that case, any third party strap is not just going to fit this thing. You need something very specific that's going to fit, but most watches out there don't have this scenario and typically are going to be able to offer a ton of third party options that you can buy from anywhere. Now to put the actual strap on the watch and just to kind of go over some basic tools that I think are very good to have, 
One is a spring bar tool, and I recommend Virgin. I have them available on my site. They've been in business since the 1700s. They're Swiss made tools, and they're just very useful. Usually they come with two different ends. One is gonna be a fork end, and then inside what it will allow you to do and how you basically chain straps is there's a little bar inside a spring bar. It's basically exactly what you imagine, a bar with a spring on it. So you take this little fork end of this strap tool, you push down on the spring and it will allow it to pop out. And then you can pull out the strap and swap in new straps or bracelets, for example. There's also a pin end of the actual bracelet and a lot of watches will have uh, scenarios where you can use that to either adjust bracelets, if it's like a pin and collar bracelet, or also drilled lugs and you can use it kind of poke out that spring bar rather than using that fork end. It's a great tool. I recommend getting Virgin. I think I've tried the cheaper ones. They're definitely the best thing to have and you'll use it almost every day if you just try to switch out straps like I do all the time. Also, there's other tools that are very useful. You can get a screwdriver set to help adjust and uh, you know change different bracelet sizes. I think that's very useful. Uh, there's other things that I think are helpful, like a time grapher, for example, to judge the accuracy of your watches if you want to kind of get into regulation and things of that nature. So that's a really nice tool. But also, there's just different things. If you want to size up bracelets, there's a you know a bracelet block, uh, different you know different tools that you can use to kind of take off case backs, uh, tweezers things of that nature. If I actually have a toolkit on my site as well that you can purchase. It's pretty affordable. It has pretty much everything that you would potentially need to be able to work on your watch in the future until you start getting really into say like modding or things of that nature. But uh, tools and straps and just accessories, I think are so important to really be able to maximize your pieces. And sometimes I don't think people really understand that this is a case. So number five, we're gonna go back to movements, understanding the different types of movements in-house versus third party, and then also looking at certifications like chronometer certified. So a couple terms that get thrown around a lot is the concept of in-house movements or different manufacturers like an ETA or Salida, Seiko, Miyota, as well as certifications like a cost certification or being a certified chronometer. Now, first looking at the idea of in-house. Now the definition of in-house movements can get a little bit gray, but in general, it is a watch movement that has been designed and developed by a manufacturer within one of their own facilities. Now, where this gets a little bit dicey is the construction of smaller parts like hairspring screws, which often can be found by specialists or created by specialists and then are put into watches. I don't wanna get into the gray area of what makes in-house, what makes something not in-house, but usually in-house movements are more widely collectible. They're more sought after. And typically to even get in the game to have your own in-house movement, it takes millions and millions of dollars to be able to create one and then to also do it at scale. Typically you're paying a premium for in-house movements. They typically are a little bit more hand finished or and elevated in terms of their overall appearance in some sort, uh, but they're not always better in performance. And I wanna get in on that. So there's also third party movements and third party movements like ETA, they're in Switzerland, they're owned by the Swatch Group. You also have Miyota, which is owned by Citizen in Japan. These movements, because they are mass produced and with some of them like the ETA 282042, having decades in the market, as well as other comparable movements like Salida, which are basically just clones or alternatives to ETA, they do have a lot of upsides. They're, they're usually cheaper to buy, they're proven in the market being produced in the millions. They've been around for years. They're easy to regulate. Parts will be easier to source down the road. And then service costs are so much lower than that of in-house movements. And I mean much lower. So yes, in-house movements definitely are nice to have, but sometimes the cost per ownership is just not there. And I think this is often not considered by buyers. So for me personally, I do not mind seeing third-party movements inside watches unless we're starting to get into price territories of real luxury brands, so like the 5,000 and up territory. But even then, usually when watches are using those type of movements, they're either using very highly modified versions of these or they're producing them at like a higher grade. So there's different grades of these movements. So you have your standards, you also have your labores and your chronometer your top grade uh, movements as well. And typically these higher grades are gonna either have up performance, but also usually up finishing as well when doing it. And these top grade movements are the ones that are sent in to be usually sent for chronometer testing to be certified chronometers. Now the most popular chronometer certification is done by COST or COSC. It's a Swiss organization that tests watch calibers through a variety of different tests. And if you want the specifics of what they're testing, there's plenty of information out there. I really don't have time to go through them all. However, a cost certification is basically just a widely recognized accreditation. It does cost money to get the movement certified, but it really just comes with added respect 
because as you, if you know watches come with this certification, you know the value that was demonstrated with both uh, the assembly, but also the regulation of the movement. And it's a good way to know that a manufacturer is not cutting corners. That said, there are internal standards for many of the brands that actually exceed what is being done by cost. So a lot of these high-end luxury brands won't even send their watches in for this because honestly, their internal testing standards are higher than that. Okay, so now number six, we have water resistance. And water resistance is probably one of the most misleading ideas in all of watchmaking. So just to give the general rundown. So when you buy a watch, you probably are going to see something mentioning water resistance in meters, which is pretty self-explanatory, or atmospheres, or ATMs, or bars. But where it gets a bit confusing is not actually the different phrases, but the misleading measurements and limitations. So when you get a watch that is tested and say it's good to up to 30 meters, that doesn't actually mean that you can do all activities up to 30 meters of water resistance. Basically, it's just testing these watches at static conditions. The problem is though, there's never usually static conditions when it comes to water. Uh, you're creating vacuums as you move your arms if you had it strapped to your wrist. There's pressure associated with being underwater at a certain degree. So there's a lot of things to consider. So just to give a rundown of what each of these different specifications mean when looking at it on your actual watch. So first you have 30 meters, three bars or three atmospheres. This is a watch that's gonna be splash resistant. So no swimming with this one. This is one you don't wanna get wet. Then you have your 50 meters of water resistance, which is gonna be splash resistance and can do some light swimming, but you wanna be a little more careful with this, not doing crazy activities with it, but will typically be okay. I personally don't swim with 50 meter water resistance watches, but however, just say maybe you're just getting in a pool, walking around, it gets a little bit wet. This is gonna be good for that. 100 meters of water resistance, 10 bar or 10 atmosphere. This is gonna be suitable for most water activities. You can swim, you could do a lot of things in the water with it. Then you have your 200 meters of water resistance, which is gonna be suitable for basically any water activity you can think of, things like snorkeling, scuba diving. That said, there's also different certifications. So like an ISO certification for dive watches or certified divers that undergo strenuous testing in order to handle harsh conditions underwater. So these are just standards that need to be met by professional diver watches. So typically these watches are 200 to 300 meters of water resistance, if not more, and just require a lot more testing to take place. There's a lot of divers out there that have 200 meters of water resistance, does not necessarily mean that it's a certified diver. A couple other things to consider with water resistance is, Watches with less holes in the case are gonna be more secure to actual water resistance. There's things called gaskets in a watch, which are basically the seals, a rubber seal within the watch that helps keep out water. Things like a screw down crown. So a crown that actually has a thread on the crown that you push down, apply pressure, and will allow it to be more kind of secure to not let water in. And then also there's different types of watches, like a chronograph, for example. I personally don't think it's ever a good idea to really swim with a chronograph unless it has screw down pushers uh, because even if you are very careful, you just bang one of those pushers in and it allows water to get into the watch, that's gonna be an issue and that's gonna be a very costly service. And finally, just because a watch is 200 meters water resistance the day you get it, it doesn't mean that it's always gonna be that as time goes on. If a watch is that tested periodically, it's always good practice if you are really pushing your watch to the limit with water to always get your gaskets, get your watch tested for its water resistance to make sure you are not at risk of the thing taking on water. Because again, that's very costly and it's a bad day if that ever happens. Now next up, we have the different types of crystals. So there's basically three tiers of crystals or three different types of crystals that you'll commonly see. First, you have your acrylic, your hazelite, or your plexiglass crystals. Then you have your mineral style crystals, and you finally have your sapphire crystals. So all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. First, looking at your plexiglass, acrylic, and hazelite crystals. These crystals are typically the most inexpensive, uh, but they do have some advantages. So they're usually easier to work with. You can dome them very simply uh, without really ex uh, high cost. They also have a very warm vintage feel because these were actually the crystals that were used in a lot of vintage watches. I personally love the look of them, but Disadvantages are they do scratch quite easily, but the good thing is you can use third-party things out there like uh, PolyWatch, for example, to really buff out scratches as long as it's not a big, big cut or crease in the actual crystal, you usually can rub these out. Then you have your mineral crystals. So these are basically a nice step up in terms of up scratch resistance compared to plexiglass crystals. They're a little bit harder to buff out scratches for, but are relatively affordable. And you also have Seiko with the proprietary Hardlex, which is more of a mineral style crystal. And then you also have sapphire crystals. The great thing about sapphires is they are very scratch resistant. They're very clear. 
but they are harder to work with and they are way more expensive. Another thing to consider with sapphire crystals is usually there is a application of anti-reflective coating, which basically just helps make the watch more anti-reflective uh, in terms of looking at the dial. So for the watch I'm wearing right now, it has two layers of anti-reflective coating. It's usually on the underside. This one has both layers of it, but really just it makes the watch look like it doesn't even have a crystal on it. So sapphires can be very clear when you have this type of anti-reflective coating on it. Now, number eight on our list here, is the different places to buy watches. So first you have your black market sellers and it basically, you wanna avoid these like the plague. This is not places that you wanna to go to buy your watches. They're typically selling replica watches or counterfeit watches. And the business practices behind this are of course illegal. They're infringing on uh, trademarks. And if you buy these watches, I don't think it's a good idea, of course. And the sellers are very much at risk of being prosecuted, facing big fines or even jail time. So I don't condone this stuff at all. I would not go this direction ever. And I don't think it's a good idea to ever have a fake watch. The world lies to you all the time. I don't think it's ever a good idea to lie to yourself by wearing a fake watch. So next up, you have your gray market sellers. Now this one's a little bit more nuanced. I wanna do a video on this in the future, kind of going into this into more detail because I think this is a very interesting concept in the industry. So gray market sellers are sellers who are non-authorized by the brands to sell the products. Now how this market is created and usually what will happen is you'll see watches maybe listed at a discount uh, compared to the retail price. And how this is all happening is basically these sellers are going and they're finding it through different countries or finding it through different sellers and uh, all these different just little loopholes and finding products and being able to list them at a discounted rate. They're usually buying things in bulk or trying to locate products to be able to list at the lowest dollar amount that they possibly can. They're not authorized to do it. It's not illegal to do it though. And from the front end standpoint, it looks like you can always get a good deal. So just a couple things to consider here when looking at the gray market, just some ideas. You don't really know where the products are coming from. Typically how it's happening is products are sold in one country and then they're pushed over to another country and then are sold at a discount. That's one way this is happening. Another thing to consider is the products themselves often are actually not in stock. So one thing you'll see typically is, hey, the product will be delivered in four to eight weeks or four to 12 weeks or something of that nature. Basically just assigned to you to say, we don't have this watch. Uh, we're gonna try to go find it and then try to get it at the lowest dollar amount to give it at the price that we promised you at. And then third here, they don't come with factory warranties. Some of these different sellers will have their own warranties, but usually I have found that they're not very good. Uh, the customer service is typically not very good for these types of sellers either, but if something does go wrong and you have to get a service, then you're kind of out of luck. You either have to spend the money to get it fixed. And then also a lot of these larger conglomerates that I mentioned earlier, are taking big action on this, even turning away some of these movements from actually being worked on uh, when something goes wrong. And when you're spending a lot of money, I think that's sometimes a big thing to think about, uh, especially when you're dealing with like expensive servicing uh, that comes with watches and owning a luxury watch. The next type of seller I think is a great option if you do wanna get something at a reasonable price or a price that is uh, I think more affordable and is going pre-owned. There's a lot of great pre-owned sellers out there that kind of give that more luxury experience and I definitely recommend this is a great way to go. Uh, I have a video where I mentioned some different third-party sellers that sell pre-owned watches as well as vintage watches, which I can mention or a link to down in the description below. But I think pre-owned sellers, uh, there's a lot of good upside with this. You can get a good price. You often, if you're buying from a trusted seller, you can again, just get that experience, but you really wanna buy the seller. There's also some scary things that can happen in the pre-owned world if you don't buy the seller. If things seem too good to be true, typically they are, usually they always are. So I would avoid that. Find a good, honest seller, has a good track record, and then just purchase from them. It's a great way to get a good deal on a watch. And then finally, you have authorized dealers. So authorized dealers are sellers that are authorized by the brand to sell their products. So my, I myself, my store is an authorized place for all the brands that I am selling. Authorized dealers usually have a better customer service experience uh, because of them representing the brands. That's not always the case. There are certainly some bad authorized dealers out there. You get access to new products and you also get factory warranties, which in a lot of cases is very helpful. Uh, if something goes wrong with the watch or say something goes wrong with the movement and you have to send it in, that's all covered if it falls within that warranty window. Because I mean, some of these servicing for luxury products and you know, they start costing hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to get some of these service. So the cost of ownership can be high and to have a long warranty is very helpful. But again, if you do want that authorized experience. I am an authorized dealer. So 5% off your first order. Love to show you what it's all about. But guys, that is this video. I'm sorry for this being so long, but I hope that this could be 
a helpful source of information, whether you are first getting into watches, as well as somebody that maybe has been in watches for a while and maybe you learned something new here today. But guys, if you liked the video, this is a ton of work to put together. Please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon if you did enjoy it. Also follow me on Instagram if you wanna stay up with future content. Again, head over to teddybaldestar.com and uh, anything else down below. Is there any other information that you think is useful for somebody that's just getting into watches uh, that maybe was overlooked here. Love to see comments down below. I wanted to get more into the technical side, not as much the subjective side of things, uh, things like collecting philosophies and things of that nature I wanted to avoid for another day. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.